would be very interested to all through this tape recording system and had other conversations through a channel that we use, the name of Phyllis Schlemmer. She lives in Israel. And there's a book written about it which is forbidden to be read in the United States. And I mentioned it briefly yesterday. It's called, uh, Anyway, it's called Briefing. Briefing for the landing on planet Earth. Okay? Just wait it all out there to try to get it. Now, it's published in England only by Corgi. And I think it came out in 1979. But once in a while you can find in some books, sorry, we can't get it published because, you know, we're forbidden to talk to the public with bad people. Well, anyway, in that book, there's a whole outline of all these conversations. Part of it answers your question. I can give you the bottom line. We had many discussions with the Nine about nuclear war. And starting in 1952, that's when I first bumped into the Nine, they said they would never allow humanity to use nuclear weapons. I'm talking about a war, not just testing and all that. And uh, every time there is a threat on the planet of somebody going ape with the idea of starting a nuclear war, my colleague, who is Sir John Whitmore, it's all of his book from England, and Phyllis Schlemmer from Israel, myself, go to different parts of the planet. We've been to Russia, and we've been to India, and China, and all over the damn place. Whenever something looks like it's going to blow up, and we go there, and we do nothing but meditate. We have a fixed target. We know what we're meditating on or who. And we don't know whether it works or not. We have no way of telling. If you have a no result, uh, you, know, you don't know. It's like the farmer out in Iowa. He says, you know, I got this whole thought way of, of getting rid of wild elephants. On, on, on our planes here in Kansas. And the guy said, well, how do I know? I never saw any white elephants, uh, big white elephants. The guy said, see, that proves it. We kept them away. That's why you've never seen white elephants. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of position we're in. So it's a very strong thing, and it's, it's emphasized to us over and over again that, you know, if worse comes to worse, they will step in. But until that time, they allowed people like myself, my colleagues, and other people on the planet who are into the peace idea uh, of doing what we can to abort an event, okay? And there's a lot of stories I could tell you about that. And so I am firm in the belief that there will be no nuclear war, even though if you know a lot about nuclear war, you go bananas. For example, any of you know that there were 53 false alarms in 1983 where our computers and radar said Russian missiles are coming in, all traced back to circuit chip problems, uh, all, all sorts of mechanical failures. Yeah. It's ridiculous stuff. So anyway, and then there are blow-ups of missiles in silos and, you know, they have a Pershing missile on the German front and some crane is handling the thing, the damn thing falls off and blows up and kills so you know, all that accidental stuff is always around and very little of it ever gets in the papers as you know unless you're right in a military setup you know what's going on and i know some of that because one of the psychics i trained worked full time for the u.s government going around the planet finding out where foul-ups occurred in nuclear missiles Nuclear uh, fissionable material is stolen here, and all sorts of crazy stuff goes on all the time. It's unbelievable. And knowing that, you'd say, my God, it's got to be an accident someday, and it's got to be a blow up. But I'm just telling you from the bottom of my heart that uh, that's what I'm told, and I believe it. I don't think there's going to be a nuclear event. Now, you have a, she had another part to her uh, question. Uh, part. Oh, so I like it, it's, the author of that book is uh, Phyllis Schlemmer. No, no, I'm sorry. It's Stuart Holroyd. It's a professional writer that we hired to do the book. Stuart Holroyd. H O L R O Y D. 
He said, well, I am afraid that little book you might find it interesting. Too bad it's not available. There we should start a little underground press and get it around. Yes, I'm sorry. You get, you no, know, absolutely. The only other part was... Beings and somebody like me said, I'm talking to the mind and we're doing this with the people. Well, it's got to either nuts or an egomaniac, and why should I listen to him, and blah, 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 you know. The suspicion that somebody might not be, you know, straight and simple and telling a straightforward story. So that's always a problem. That's why I don't speak about it very often. If I had network time and could read 60 million people at a shop, I wouldn't mind going up there. They could shoot me afterwards, and they got my message out, right? But it's, it's a very delicate thing, okay? How do you reconcile? You have to put the theory on the way, Or he did not observe uh, this shutter effect on the things that he saw, but I made it, made it clear that what he saw were robots. They were not people. They were not teams. So it's not a good test. He himself is also, uh, well, I shouldn't say he is not. Whenever he's a bad boy, he's a young kid, and he is a bad boy once in a while, he gets teleported out in outer space, and he disappears. And he's thrown back into wherever he left. And he tells me that when he's there, aboard a spacecraft, and is talking to real people, and certain to we understand people, that they do look like real people, and they do have eyes and ears and hair and that sort of thing. Most of them, he says, are much smaller than people. They're kind of little, compact, uh, and wizard-looking people, you know, narrow faces, sharp points, and so on. At least that's the type he deals with. There must be other types that we have not dealt with. But I don't know about this particular thing. This guy may have run into some group that looks like that. I don't know. What does the robot look at? Uh, the robots are kind of cute. They're, uh, they have... <laughs> Little heads that look like uh, they have all this stuff in the file somewhere. They have little heads that look like German World War One officers' helmets, you know, like that. Oh yeah. And then they have kind of a head thing that comes, a neck thing that comes straight down. And they go down. They have no arms like this, and they go straight to the floor without any feet, and they do have things that appear to be optical systems here, but they don't have any breathing things, they have no mouth and so on, and they don't have any apparent ears, and when they move, they just kind of float around, they don't you know, do what we do with our little two feet, but that's really about what they look like. So apparently there's a whole computer in here, there's a whole sensor system here, there's a brain that computes the information. And uh, they say they hang around in space for millions of years. They've got pretty good reliability in their <laughs> production. Well, uh, John is in a very peculiar state. I don't know whether you know what, about what he does, but not in the last couple of years, I know what that is. He's on and off of a drug called ketamine. Yeah, we do. And when he's on the drug, it's no big secret. I mean, everybody knows it. And when he's on the thing, he's impossible, and when I say impossible, he literally, absolutely, I've been with him when this happened, said, God, you old son of a bitch, I challenge you, I'm stronger than you are, I'm more powerful. <laughs> and that's a bad side of human nature when you lose humility, especially in the presence of the Creator. And uh, he's not in bad shape right now, but he's had little problems. He's lost his uh, dolphin yeah. research lab and a few other things. But they're not the same nine. Just forget it. He's, he's on the, the other side of the fence. Do you know what happened to Marshall Moore? I wish I did. <laughs> I don't. She also was on Peony Academy when she disappeared. That was an interesting therapy. Uh, he gets so out of hand that I mean, I, He's speaking of John there. Lilly. He just takes whatever money he has, a credit card, gets on a plane and goes somewhere. And the last time he did this, he wound up in Hanover, New Hampshire, because he went to Dartmouth. And he was just picked up on the street by an old vagrant bum, you know, staggering around, didn't know what the hell was going on. Fortunately, the police that picked him up took him into the you know, Dartmouth Medical Center. And one of the... Uh, residents were smart enough to recognize that it was famous John Lilly 
and he called up a bunch of us in New York to rescue this guy, take him into our hands and, you know, get him dried out. So we did and got him into a drying out clinic and eventually got back home. He starts out all over again.